God of our hearts, we welcome you to this space, this space of worship, this space of healing. May the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you, O God. Amen. This morning, I want to invite us to begin with a moment of reflection. Can you think about a time when the action of one person might have changed your life? And if you have a, a pen near you and a piece of paper, um, maybe, maybe write that person's name, just so that we can welcome that into this room. Can you think of one act of kindness that perhaps influenced, influenced your life's journey? Can you think about one person in your life who saw you, who opened the door for you, said the right words to you, and consequently, your life was changed forever? And sometimes is maybe more than one person who saw us, Maybe it's more than one incident, but I'd like you to just take a few seconds and think about what actions of that one person changed your life and where you would have been had it not been because someone saw you, opened the door for you, said the right words to you. Take a few seconds to do that. And as we gather our thoughts around that, let us send a prayer of gratitude, even if they're no longer in the world, for what they have done for you. See, what happens often is that we are in this quest, a con constant quest, to change ourselves. We are here now uh, probably about four weeks, maybe, a little, maybe five, coming into five weeks, since the year began. And I am wondering, how are we doing with our proposed resolutions? Are we sticking to our exercise plan? How is our healthy eating going? This is not intended to, to place guilt in your heart, <laughs> but to invite you to reflect. <laughs> and maybe, you know, our, our really ambitious goal may, may be looking like it's a little bit less plausible because we said we were going to lose 50 pounds by February 15th. <laughs> right? Because we kind of go into that. We were like, no, that's it. This is it. This is the moment. We're going to do it. No more kidding around. We're just going to get to this. And that's probably around December 30th, right? And then the 31st comes, and you say, well, you know, I'll start tomorrow. And, you know, and I was... <laughs> You know, and then the second comes, so it's technically still the holiday, <laughs> you know. And then if you are Puerto Rican, you're like, oh, my Christmas hasn't even arrived. It's not even January 6th, so I can't even, you know, make that resolution. So it's, um, it's interesting, right, how we think. I was, I was in Puerto Rico recently seeing my family, and there was this song that said, um, the premise of the song was, I will start my diet tomorrow. <laughs> And it just is, it was funny and all of it, but it really encapsulated the way we think. And you know, tomorrow is a new day, so tomorrow is full of hope. And then tomorrow comes. And we're still with the same situation because we haven't altered some of our behaviors before we entered into that in our mindset. So, I, th again, this is not a, this is not a feel guilty kind of, conversation. This is a, it's all of us in this together, 
in this quest of bettering ourselves. But I want us to take a moment this morning to depart our, ourselves from this self-improvement journey for just a few seconds and perhaps to shift our goal a little bit toward including others, having an impact on the life of our neighbor, loving not only our neighbor but also the stranger. If we think about it, the, the first questions that I asked you this morning, if we really think about them, we will discover that our life-changing moments were those moments that were experienced with others. And the scripture lesson this morning tells us that Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew, and he was with James and John, and Simon's mother was ill. She was in bed with a fever. And they told him about her condition immediately. And Jesus healed her. And how she responded to being healed was she then began to serve them. Now, it is not lost on me that this passage has been used by many to preclude women from being ordained, from preaching from a pulpit, from even teaching at a seminary. They have been used, as some might say, to keep women in their place, in the kitchen, serving. But this morning I submit to you that what the text, the text is demonstrating to us is not a gender issue, but a call to discipleship. <laughs> what we have received from God has it launched, to, launched us to do for others in the world? What we have received from God has it pushed, the, pushed us forward to look at others with compassion? When others heard that Jesus had healed her, had healed Simon's mother-in-law, of whom we do not know her name, others came so that Jesus will heal them as well. The Dalai Lama said that the experience of compassion toward a single individual shapes our actions towards others. And what I see at the center of Jesus' ministry most of the time, if not always, is this spirit of compassion. It is evident and overtly the centrality of Jesus' ministry. Because after some time of prayer, the passage tells us, it seems like Jesus was then determined to continue to heal others. And that they, then he stated with <coughs> confidence that this is what he had been called to do. This week, I have wrestled with how much, with the question of how much do we value the life of others? And th is this value that we place on the human life contingent upon the person's last name, social economic status? Is this value affected by the other person's gender, race, sexual orientation? Recently, in Puerto Rico, where I'm from, on Monday, to be exact, the government passed a law which they labeled La Ley 1018, Law 1018, that said that it was, it was intended to be the, the law that protected religious liberty. La Ley que protege la libertad religiosa. And that, the premise of the law really was, or is, that if you are a government employee, you can deny to offer services to someone who is contrary or quote unquote violates your religious beliefs. In other words, if I go to look for my marriage certificate with my husband's Sabas, 
someone might say, we don't believe that people from two different countries should get married. It's against our religious beliefs. So you are not going to receive your marriage certificate. No marriage certificate for you. And so what it's really astounding to me is that we are in an emergency crisis. Not only in the island of Puerto Rico particularly because he has not recovered from Hurricane Maria. And so I am told that people spent nights, like this was voted in in the middle of the night and all this energy so that we continue not to see others, so that we continue to diminish the value of other human beings. And what's sad about this is that we think that when others are marginalized, it's never about us. We think that immediately people are saying, you know, this is because um, we, we want to, you know, this is geared to the LGBTQ community, and it is. But when one of us is affected, all of us are affected. And this is what we fail to see when we are walking in this world. And so what value does we as Christians see in one another? And where is our compassion as Christians in this world? If we are going to be agents of healing as Jesus stated he was called to be, and by extension we are called to be, how do we see others? Some might say that we are all equal, that we all matter. And that word tends to not see those who matter the least. But when it comes to life-changing actions, it's important that we see who do we favor. Psychologist Emma Sapala argues that when we look at compassion, compassion is often confused with that, what it, well, with empathy. Because empathy, as defined by researchers, is the visceral or emotional experience of another person's feelings. It is, in a sense, an automatic mirroring of another's emotion, like tearing up at a friend's sadness. Altruism is an action that benefits someone else. It may or may not be accompanied by empathy or compassion. For example, when we make a donation for tax purposes. Although these terms are related to compassion, they're not identical. Compassion often does, of course, involve an emphatic, empathic response in an altruistic behavior. However, compassion is defined as the emotional response when perceiving suffering and involves an authentic desire to help. And so this morning, I would argue that if we are going to be prophets of healing, we need to begin to understand the suffering of others so that we have an authentic desire to help. With this in mind, we have to look at those who are around us. Years ago, in, in July of, of 2012, the New York Times they published an article called Compassion Made Easy. It's so interesting how we diminish things, right? Like compassion for dummies. <laughs> it's so it's interesting how we like to just simplify things. But they actually stated some very important things. And one of them was that what the results suggest is that compassion we feel for others is not solely a function of what befalls them. If our minds draw an association between a victim and ourselves, even a relatively trivial one, the compassion we feel for his or her suffering is amplified greatly. What does this mean for cultivating compassion in society? It means that effortful adherence to religious or philosophical dictums, often requiring prayer and other things, though clearly valuable and capable of producing results, is not the only way to go. In other words, 
when we, we that value prayer, when someone is hungry, praying is not enough. We need to give them some food. When someone is suffering injustice, just saying, I'm going to pray for you is not enough. We need to dig deeper to see how we walk in their journey with them. We further suggest that finding commonalities would generate greater empathy among all of us and foster social harmony. And so I've given you a lot of information on compassion this morning. So considering these findings, when we witness acts of unkindness, acts where the welfare of others is blatantly disregarded, can we conclude that those involved do not acknowledge any commonalities among each other? In other words, what, are, what, we, what, what the findings propose is that we only feel compassion or we are tend to feel compassion with those that we can relate to. And that is our challenge. How do we as Christians see the other? Because it's not, you know, for me, you know, we all walk on this journey separately. But for me, the challenge is not so much to love the, my neighbor. The challenge often is, how do I love the stranger? The one I know nothing about. The one that speaks different than me, lives different than me. The one that doesn't understand my life style, the one that I don't fully understand their life traditions. How do we love the stranger? And so I like to think that after Jesus healed so many people, and after he healed Simon's mother-in-law, the scripture tells us he went away in prayer. And it was that moment, that, that moment of solitude, that solidified for Jesus what he was called to do. That moment of God and you, me and God. And so that moment of where am I here for? And so church this morning, you know, I think that our journey is not so much defined by, you know, our moments of worship which are important but they are defined by a personal relationship with God, by understanding and seeing each other every day and trying to see each other as God sees us, and to really feel challenged every day into walking into Jesus' steps and understanding and taking the burden that is of discipleship. If we have been healed, and I'll, I'll begin again with my initial questions. When Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law, she responded by serving. If God has given us something, whatever it is, if we have been blessed by God in our journey, how are we responding? What is our response to the deposit of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us? And once we determine that, let us then define our response by Jesus' works, by Jesus' words, and by the compassion that every healer has to have in their heart. This week, I want you to go and take a moment again to do further introspection and reflection. Who were the people who opened the door for you? Who saw you? Who blessed you in a way that changed your life? And then go forth and do the same. Amen.